Right. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Couch Warrior Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today we're going to be breaking down UFC Vegas 8 and 89. And honestly, you know, there was some hate for this card. I get that last week's card was pretty rough, but this is a good card. I like a lot of these fights. It's a tough one betting wise because there's not many parlay pieces if you're into that. And then a lot of the underdogs do have value, but there's also downsides to a lot of them. And we are going to talk about all that. But you know, entertainment wise, I actually think this is a great card and I'm really looking forward to it real quick. Before we start up, we'll do a quick recap of last week and then we'll hop right in. I'm trying to do this relatively quickly, not spend too much time on fights that we don't need to spend time on. But last weekend we did pretty damn good. We had cage warriors first on Saturday. We ripped three bets in a row, clean sweep for four units. That was nice. And then for the actual UFC card, we cleared about three units would have been a bit more if I tracked properly with the Amorim sub, but that's okay. At the end of the day, money's money. We did cash all of our money lines except for the Angelusa one where we got saved quite a bit. Definitely got lucky there. The Christian Rodriguez money line, we cashed that. I get the argument. Honestly, I thought Dogarian won as well, but <clears throat> I'm not a judge. I'm going to take, <laughs> take my cash when I get it. The Mike Davis bet at minus 265, easy, easy money. Chelsea Chandler, that was a good bet in my opinion, plus 124. And then we had the Mearshart round two, that was clutch. We had the Morim sub, and the rest we didn't do too good on, but we ended up profiting 3.18 units, so that's nice. And hopefully we can keep it going with this card. I think there's a lot of good underdog spots. I've got a lot of stuff written down and a few plays already made, and I will give out a free play on this show. The rest of my plays you can find on Beer Money Picks Discord. Links in my description of this video, in my YouTube bio, and in my Twitter bio. So let's hop right in. First fight up, we've got Muhammad Usman versus Mick Parkin. Usman 10-2-0. 34 years old. He's six foot two with a 79-inch reach. Parkin 8-0 undefeated. 28 years old, so he's going to be six years younger, going to be two inches taller, and they have the same reach. For me, I like Mick Parkin to win. In terms of betting on it, you know, he's like minus 140 right now, and I don't really know how anyone could be too comfortable with that. He did look pretty bad in his last fight against Kai Machado. Machado, in my opinion, stinks, and he completely outstruck Parkin. And it's not like Machado is some clean boxer. He has good output which Usman doesn't really have. Usman had pretty good output in the Collier fight, but in general, Usman's pretty low output, and he does strike pretty wild. Everything's got a loop to it except for his jab, which I actually really like. But that same style worked out for Cal Machado, and you know he did lose that fight, but that's because Parkin was able to use his wrestling as well. And I don't know if he can take Usman down. We haven't really seen it. Usman's been taken down like on the regionals back when, but it's been a minute and no one's really attempting to shoot on him. So we don't exactly know how good his takedown defense is. We don't know if Parkin can really take him down. And I tend to think that his takedown defense should be pretty good. He is a good wrestler. He's got a good background and he's very strong, very physical. So I can see Parkin struggling to take him down. And Parkin hasn't shown good takedown defense in his own right. You know, no one's really shot on him since getting to the UFC. Jamal Pogues shot once, but that was it. And Pogues isn't very explosive with his takedowns at all. And when he fought Eduardo Neves on the Contender Series, he did get taken down twice in a row really early in the fight. And then Neves just absolutely gassed. Usman, he can gas too, but I think his cardio is better than someone like Eduardo Neves. I think his game, just everything put together is better than Eduardo Neves. And I can see him giving Parkin some problems, but in terms of just straight striking, I think Parkin is a much better striker. I think he's a better boxer. I think he's cleaner. He is relatively hittable, and that jab of Usman can open up some counters for him. But in, in general, if you're asking me to tell you who's the better striker, I think it's Parkin. Who's the better offensive wrestler? I think it's Usman, and I can see him getting takedowns. Can he hold down Parkin? I'm not sure. I haven't seen too much of Parkin's ground game defensively. He got back up against Nevis pretty quick, but Usman is very physical. He's very strong. So I wouldn't be shocked if he was able to hold down Parkin as well. 
I do think Parkin wins. I'm not going to be getting there in terms of a bet unless something changes drastically with the line. But as long as he can keep this on the feet, I do think he's got better output, and I do think he's got the cleaner striking. So I th do think he should win, but I'd be careful. I'm seeing a lot of people just max betting him, saying, oh, he's Aspinall's training partner. Wow, wow, wow. He's going to win. Dude, is it good that he's training with a good training partner? Yes, that's great. Aspinall, champion, really, really good fighter. That's good. But it's not everything. Just because someone trains with a champ or someone really good, it doesn't mean that they're going to be good. Great example, Maurice Green and John Jones. Is Maurice Green some kind of stud now that he trains with Jones? No, he's not. He's still horrible. Dante Mays trains with Jones. Did that change his game much? No, it did not. So is Parkin going to keep just like being like, is Parkin going to be amazing every single time out because he trains with Aspinall? I don't think so. And I wouldn't use that as a reason to make your bet here. If you're betting Parkin, you should be doing it because you don't think Usman can get him down and you don't think Usman can compete on the feet. I think he might be able to. So I'm passing for now. But Mick Parkin is the pick for me. Moving on real quick, we got Dixon over here in the chat. I don't really subscribe to that angle, Dixon. And Beer Money picks in the chat. Thank you very much. Moving on, though, we've got Igor Severino versus Andre Lima. Igor is 8-0. and oh, He's undefeated, 20 years old, 5'7", with a 70-inch reach. On the other side, we got Andre Lima. He's 7-0, and oh, undefeated as well. Five years old, they're at 25. He's going to be the same height. And he's going to be at about a three-inch reach disadvantage, two-inch reach disadvantage. And um, this, one, this one's tough for me. I'm not really confident on either side. I think that Igor is still really young at 20, and he makes a lot of mistakes, like a lot of mistakes. In his fight on the Contender Series against Silva, he was getting outstruck on the feet in that first round. He throws really, really wild. He does have good pressure. He's got some good wrestling. Clearly has power. I mean, the, sh the impact from the shots, you could hear it. In that second round on the contender series, he was beating the crap out of Silva at that point and was able to put him away. Is he going to be able to do that here against Lima, though? I'm not convinced. Lima's a cleaner striker than him. That I'm pretty confident in. Lima's also a pretty good grappler. I have seen him taken down before, so I wouldn't be shocked if uh, Severino can take down Lima. But I don't know if he's going to be able to submit him. I'm not sure that he's going to be able to hold him down. Lima has shown pretty solid takedown defense overall. He's shown solid jujitsu defense, and he's shown a solid ability to get back up. So because I think he's cleaner, and I don't really think Severino is going to be able to knock him out or wrestle him for three rounds, I am going to pick Lima to win the fight. But I want nothing to do with him at minus 170. I don't think his output is high enough. I can see Igor backing him up, making it difficult for him to have – his range and to be cleaner than him. If Igor's just pushing this brawl on him and I could, I could see Igor winning. I don't think he's the worst underdog shot in the world. I've also considered his uh, finish only play where, you know, it means that if he gets a finish, he wins. If he gets finished, he loses. If it goes to a decision, you get your money back. I don't really see Lima finishing him at a high clip. So I do think that's a possible look and something I'm checking out, but I haven't gotten there yet. I'm going to pick Lima to win. Super low confidence, though, and I definitely wouldn't suggest playing him at chalk. I don't think that's the move. Moving on, we've got Montserrat Rendon versus Daria Zelzniakova. Rendon is 6-0. and oh. She's undefeated. She's going to be 35 years old, 5'8 with a 68-inch reach. Daria, she's 8-1-0. and oh. She's going to be 28, so she is 7 years younger, going to be 1 inch taller, don't have her reach. So... This is a close fight, in my opinion. I'm leaning towards Rendon at this price right now because for me, Daria is fine. I do think she's the better striker. She's pretty crisp. She creates good angles, mixes it up well on the feet, but she slows down pretty quickly. Her takedown defense isn't great at all. The Dixon fight was a bad look. I mean, she was piercing Dixon up, but the second she got taken down, it was over. It's like she didn't know what to do. And in the fight before that, not Jawa because Liana Jawa, she won that fight well. But Liana's super limited. She can grapple and that's it. And she's not a good offensive wrestler either. So that's not, not the most impressive win for me. I think it was the Ibraiva fight. I don't remember exactly which one it was. But she was getting taken down in that fight. Didn't think it was a great look. The woman was smaller than her. It's, it, it's just it's a concern. If you're backing Daria at minus 200, whatever it is, minus 225, you have to be convinced she's not going to get taken down and that she's not going to slow down. And I don't really think you can be sure of that. Rendon is not a world beater. She's not a stud or anything. She's not going to be a champion. But 
She's very serviceable. She's very big and strong. She does have solid striking. It's nice and straight. You don't really see her winging crazy bombs. And I do think she can land on Daria, who doesn't have the best striking defense. And Rendon isn't a D1 wrestler by any means. She's not going to come out and shoot 40 times. Doesn't have the best technique in the world. But she does have pretty decent wrestling. And I can see it being enough to take down Daria when Daria slows down. The way I see it playing out personally, Daria wins the first round, outstrikes uh, Rendon, slows down, and Rendon starts to take over, being able to land her own shots on the feet, land takedowns, and win a decision. So I'm going with Rendon in this one, and we can move on. Next up, we've got Steven Nguyen versus Jarno Aaron. Steven is 9-1-0. and He's 30 years old, 5'11", with a 73-inch reach. Aaron's 13 Five and one. He's going to be 29, so he's one year younger. Same height, same reach. This is another spot where, you know, I, I'm interested in the underdog more than I am in the favorite. I think that Aaron's does have a path here. I think that Steven is pretty hittable. I think that Steven can be taken down. We haven't seen him get outworked on the ground too much, but he hasn't really fought anyone with amazing grappling. He did get he did um get taken down twice by Theo here in his first content, not his first, his third contender, second. Sorry, he's been on the Contender Series three times. The third one is what got him into the UFC. That was against Cunningham. But in the second one against Theo, he was fighting a guy in Theo who's not good, who's very short, and he still got taken down twice, got controlled a bit. That's not a great look. And then he didn't fight for a minute, and he comes in and he fights Cunningham in a pretty decent fight. He did get the finish there, but Cunningham's chin, in my opinion, isn't very good. I thought Ludovic Klein would knock him out for sure, and he did. He takes a lot of damage, Cunningham, and Steven was able to just let it rip and ultimately get a nutritional finish. He's not some huge power striker, but he does have really good output, and it does tend to add up if the guys don't have good defense. I can see him outpointing Aaron's here because Aaron's has bad output. I don't know why, because he's a great striker. In his last fight against, I believe it was uh, Choi, yeah, I really felt that he could have won that fight if he just let it go a little bit more. Choi did beat up on his leg on his legs there with a lot of leg kicks, and that's not a weapon we see Steven using often. So I'm thinking maybe that will be a, good for Aaron's where he doesn't have to worry about that as much, and his legs won't be compromised so he can keep it up with the output, with the pressure, because he does like to pressure. And I think in terms of just technique, I think his striking is real good. I do think he can hurt Nguyen. I think he can knock out Nguyen. I think he can land the more damaging shots. His uppercuts are really nice. His combos are pretty nice. Everything about the striking I like except the output. If he comes in here and throws like Cunningham did, I think he beats Nguyen at a really high clip. If he doesn't, I can see him being outpointed. But at the same time, like he also has really good grappling. Not necessarily offensive wrestling. It's not very good. He can get takedowns here and there. And I'm thinking because I don't think Steven's takedown defense is that good, I do think Aaron's could maybe get those takedowns. But once he's on the ground, the jujitsu is actually really impressive. The back takes are clean. The transitions are clean. Almost tapped Gomez in the end of the third round. That was super tight. And, you know, Gomez, he's able to use his wrestling. He had better wrestling than Aaron's, was able to slow down the fight a bit. Nguyen doesn't do that. You're not going to see Steven wrestle. You're not going to see Steven clinch much. He's a range striker, uses his reach, and he's good at it. You don't see him winging wild bombs. He's clean down the pipe. So, yeah, I could see him outpointing Aaron's, but I think Aaron's has all the finishing upside. I think Aaron's has submission upside. I think he's got knockout upside. So, for me, I'm leaning Aaron's. I don't know if I'm going to play the money line just because the line's kind of getting messed up. And he's already, like, plus 145. Had I gotten, like, plus 180, would have been a pretty easy click to make. At plus 145, I'm less tempted because... It, it is pretty obvious to me that if he's not going to get the finish or if he doesn't come in with better output, which I can't just assume he will, that he can lose a decision here. So I'll be looking at other stuff, maybe the inside the distance props, maybe the finish only props. I think those could be pretty good, but we can move on to the next one. I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick Aaron's tentatively. Again, he could lose the decision here, but I think he's got a good shot. Real quick, catching up with the chat. Lucky Tim, what's up, brother? Jarno season, yes, sir. I am a little concerned. A lot of us are on him, but that doesn't always mean a bad thing. MMA locker room, thanks for tuning in, brother. <laughs> the bed hasn't been around for a minute now. I think it's been a good... I moved here in February. We're now in March. So, yeah, it's been like four, four, four weeks or so, four cards that I've taped, and uh, no bed in the background anymore. CT, 
I feel like you come in every week. You should you should be used to the new background by now. But th- what's up, brother? Thanks for tuning in as well. All right, moving on. We've got Miles Johns versus Cody Gibson. Johns is going to be 13 2 and 0. Oh, he's 29 years old, five foot seven with a 66 inch reach. Gibson 19 8. No, 19, 9 and 0, 36. He's going to be seven years older, going to be three inches taller, and he's going to be at a five inch reach advantage. For me, I like Gibson a lot here, and that's going to be my free bet of the week. Gibson is my, the spot I'm taking. He was the first bet I made on this card. I put two units on him, I believe, at plus 124 or plus 126. And I, I like the spot a lot. I get that he's older, I get that Miles Johns is more athletic. But and I guess Miles is more powerful, but those things aren't going to get the job done for you alone. Like they just won't. Miles is relatively low output in every single fight. He had one fight where he had a good output against Anderson Dos Santos, and that was it. Every other fight is low output. Every single fight he's slowing down in the third round over and over and over again. I don't know how many times people have to see it to believe it. He slowed down against Vince Morales, who I don't think is very good. He slowed down huge against Castaneda, and Castaneda was able to finish him. We've seen it time and time again, and I just think that Gibson brings a really good pace, really good output. He's going to be the better striker at range, and I'm pretty confident in that. He's got the reach advantage. He uses that length. You don't see him winging crazy bombs that are going to leave him open for counters, usually clean one-twos down the pipe. He's more than happy to dirty box. We saw that in the Katona fight, and if he does that with Johns, sure. Johns could knock him out. He's got a lot of power, but... If he doesn't knock out Gibson, I think Gibson wins the minutes here on the feet. I think that if Johns tries to shoot, good luck. Gibson's actually got really good takedown defense. He's a bit easier to take down later in the fight, like we saw in the Ray Borg fight where he slowed down. But Ray Borg, in my opinion, is a much better wrestler than Johns. And Johns doesn't have the cardio to do that. He just doesn't have the cardio. Like, if he's going to be trying to shoot for three rounds, he's going to get exhausted. And that's just going to help out with my Gibson play. And if he doesn't do that, I still think Gibson's going to win on the feet. So I don't really understand why Johns is such a heavy favorite. I don't understand why people like him so much here. He's on short notice as well, as if the cardio itself wasn't a problem already. On a full camp, he's gassing. And what do you think is going to happen in a short notice bout where he's fighting a guy who can throw a ton of output, who's very difficult to to take down, and will keep moving forward, forward, forward? It's good. I think it's a bad spot for Johns. I think Cody's going to win this fight, and that's going to be my free pick of the week. I really like Gibson here. Catching up real quick, we got Evans. Evan, what's up, brother? It's been a minute. My guy, he's doing a bunch now, too. Make sure you guys check out Evan on Twitter. It's like Evan with like 14 A's. That's my guy, though. Uh, Hadim, what's up, brother? Miles coming in on short notice for a reason. Not sure what you mean for a reason, but yeah, short notice is definitely going to hurt him, in my opinion. Fight Realm, what's up? Thanks for tuning in. I know his wrestling's been forgotten, but I think Miles, no one's forgetting about it. It's fine, but Gibson's got good takedown defense, and Miles doesn't have the cardio on a full camp to wrestle for 15 minutes. The hell is he going to do with on short notice? He's going to come out here and shoot 10 takedowns? I highly doubt it. What's with that LFA 179 line that's minus 2,000 on bet online? Both dudes have one fight. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I have not taped LFA, and I don't think I'm going to have the time for it this week. Your boy's pretty busy right now, but I imagine if a one fight guy has a minus 2000 line, he's probably either got a good uh, amateur record or the other guy must be abysmal. But either way, I would not suggest betting minus 2000 on a guy with one fight. And he wants the check, in my opinion, says Hadim. It's possible. I'm not really going to try to figure out why or why not he's here. I think that Outside of the narrative, there's already enough to bet on Gibson here. So I think he's a really good underdog spot, and we can move on. Next up, we've got Ricardo Ramos versus Julian Arosa. Ramos, he's 16, 5-0. Sorry, guys, the text is really small for me when I'm trying to read it. He's 28 years old, 5'9", with a 72-inch reach. Team Alpha Male is his camp, Arosa. He's going to be 28, 11, and oh, 34 years old. So he's six years older, going to be four inches taller, and he's going to have a two and a half inch reach advantage. This one's tough for me because technique for technique, just looking at the matchup, I think Arosa is a really live underdog. I do think he can win this fight. We've seen Ramos slow down. We've seen Ramos be low output. We've seen Ramos depend on his wrestling. 
And Erosa has decent takedown defense. I do think he's going to stuff a lot of it. And he can be taken down here, but Ramos doesn't have the best control. Erosa's got great scrambling. He's got good jujitsu of his own. I don't necessarily think Ramos is going to submit him. And on the feet, I, I really like Erosa. He's got a lot of good output. He's nice and clean. He mixes it up really well. He's good up close. He's good in the pocket. He's got nice clinch knees, uh, mixes in the elbows. I like a lot about Erosa. The Hakeem Dawudu fight was really, really impressive. I did bet him there. I didn't expect him to look like that, but it, it was a good spot. But he did use his grappling in that fight, and I don't necessarily think he can grapple Ramos. If he wants to win this, he's going to have to outstrike him, which he can do. But the reason I'm hesitating and why I don't think I can get to a bet on Erosa is just the chin. At this point, you know, sometimes I'll ignore the chin issues if I don't think they're really that significant. But at this point, I mean, it's pretty clear. Alex Caceres got him with a clean shot. Caceres is not a power striker. And that wasn't really a good look. And then Padilla, you know, Padilla hits relatively hard, but I think he's only got like four knockouts and Erosa is one of them. And I mean, he stunned Erosa and it wasn't like it was a huge shot or anything like that. It was fine, but the chin is definitely a concern. And Ramos, he's not the most amazing striker, but he does have power. He's very explosive and it would be very classic for him to come out here and knock out Erosa with like a spinning kick or a spinning elbow. And if I have <laughs> Erosa there, and he gets knocked out like that, I'd be pretty furious. So I think Erosa is a super live dog. I'm tempted to even pick him to win outright. I don't know if I'm ready to do that. But in terms of a bet, we'll see if I get to him. If I do, it'll be on Beer Money Picks Discord as always. But the chin, the chin is very concerning. So we're going to have to see what happens there. I guess I'll pick Erosa anyways for the purposes of the show, just because I do think he's super live. But yeah, hesitating on the on, in terms of betting him. Mushroom, what's up, brother? How are you doing? Am I going to UFC Atlantic City? I actually don't think I am anymore, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. And yes, smash the like button, guys. Appreciate you, Mushroom, as always. Make sure you guys are checking out Mushroom. He's got a YouTube channel as well. He's a cool dude. All right, moving on. We got Trey Ogden versus Kurt Hollibau. Trey is 16, 6, and 0, 34 years old. He's 5 foot 11 with a 72 inch reach. Kurt on the other side, he's going to be 27 and oh, 37 years old. He's three years older, same height, one inch reach advantage for Kurt. So first off, I don't think Kurt's actually going to be the same height as Ogden. This is just a guess of mine based off of an eye test, looking at them and their opponents. I do think Ogden's going to be taller, but regardless, in terms of the actual matchup, I wanted to pick Kurt, but I don't think I can. He is the better boxer up close for sure. He's going to be able to outbox Ogden. I do think he's going to land more, the more significant shots. He does go to the body really well. He's super aggressive. Ogden likes to maintain his range and work from there. He likes to use that jab, that check left hook, his leg kicks. But Kurt's not really going to let him do that. He's going to make it hard for him. So I can see a world where Kurt's able to cut the cage and make it hard for Ogden to maintain that range and do what he does best when he's striking. But I can also see Ogden moving laterally a lot and making it difficult for Kurt to locate him, difficult for Kurt to land those shots. If he's able to use his jab, keep his strike straight down the pipe like he normally does, his striking has seemed to gotten a lot, it seemed to have gotten a lot better. And I think the main thing here that is keeping me off of Kurt is that Ogden is a very solid wrestler. He's got good control. I think he can stay safe on the ground. He's been submitted before. Two of them by the same person, Thomas Gifford, was able to guillotine him the exact same way both times. So I, I can see Kurt catching him. But in terms of once they're on the ground and Ogden is on top, I think it's going to be hard for Kurt to be able to get back up. And we've seen it time and time again with him. His takedown defense isn't good. Even on the Ultimate Fighter against, um, I don't remember his name, I think Rico something. He was uh, one of McGregor's boys from um, from his camp. And he did get taken down there a bunch. He was able to reverse a few times, and ultimately he was able to get the win there. But I don't know if he's going to be able to submit Ogden, honestly. And like I said, on the feet, sure, he's live. He's live for that finish. He's live to beat up on Ogden up close. But Ogden has gotten a lot better at keeping that range. He was able to do it against Nicholas Moda, who I think is also a really powerful striker up close. He's able to stay safe for the most part. He did get hurt in the second round. But I, I think he has the tools to be able to win this against Kurt. So Ogden is going to be the pick. Do I want to play him a minus 155 against a guy who I think is much more dangerous? Absolutely not. I have no interest in that. 
I don't know if I'm betting a single favorite on this card, to be honest. I think there's like two that I'm interested in. Other than that, not many. The way I'm thinking about this one is maybe Kurt decision, no action. I haven't gotten there yet. I don't know if I'm going to make that bet, but it's something I'm looking at. It's minus 140 on bet online. We'll see what the domestic books give us. But if it's a better price than that, it might be something that I do because I think most of the finishing upside is with Kurt. If the if you tell me right now the fight definitely finishes inside the distance, I think Kurt probably won then because Ogden doesn't have much finishing upside. What is he going to do? He's going to submit Kurt. He can. He's got a bunch of submissions, but I doubt it. Is he going to knock out Kurt? I really doubt that one. So if you're telling me for sure it ends ITD, I think it's Kurt. Otherwise, I think it's probably Ogden. This decision only Ogden could be a look, but I don't think it's going to be playable at all. I imagine they're they're going to be on top of it, probably open it up at like minus 220, something like that. So I don't think that's really playable. So yeah, going to go with Ogden as a pick. I'm relatively confident that he can pull it off. But in terms of a bet, I don't think there's too much value there. I think that you're better off looking at a way to maybe bet Kurt ITD or like I mentioned, finish only. Moving on, we've got Luis Pajuelo versus Fernando Padilla. Pajuelo, he is 8-1 and 0, oh, going to be 29 years old, 5 foot 10 with a set, let's call it a 70 inch reach. Padilla on the other side, he's 15-5 and 0, oh, 27, he's going to be 2 years younger. He's going to be 3 inches taller at 6 foot 1 and he's going to have a 6 inch reach advantage. So, I really wanted to like Pajuelo here. I really di did because I backed him on the contender series against uh, Bobby Ring, I believe his name is his name. And he, he looked good there, but he also didn't in the beginning. In, in the beginning of that fight, Ring was finding a lot of success on the feet. He was landing a lot with his straight strikes down the pipe. And Ring is primarily a wrestler, and you know he's fought at a really low level. So that wasn't great. But Pelwello was able to use what he does every single time, make the fight dirty, use his pressure, his dirty boxing, and he was able to break ring there. A lot of body shots. Ultimately, I think a knee to the body on the ground is what ended the fight, or at least led to the finish. And, you know, he he's a really good, he's a really, I don't want to say good. He's a very solid boxer. He's a good boxer. That's But that's really it. You know, you don't see him throwing a ton of kicks. He's certainly not an offensive wrestler. His takedown defense is abysmal. I've seen him taken down by terrible people on the, on the regional scene. I've seen him get his back taken by guys who have no business taking his back. Um, and he's so hittable. He, 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 like, he, he, doesn't get, he doesn't care. He comes right forward. He'll take your shots, and he just wants to give them back. And that's not a great look against a guy like Padilla, who also has some decent power, who is going to have a significant rate, uh, reach advantage here, six inches. He uses that range well. And I think he's going to land a lot on Pajuelo here. I think he's going to hurt Pajuelo quite a bit. I can see him finishing him, either a knockout or a submission. I can see either one because, like I said, Pavuelo does have really bad takedown defense. He gives up his back trying to get back up. So I, I, I can't bet Pavuelo here as the underdog. I think he probably loses this fight. I think he can get finished. Do I want to bet Padilla at minus 150? Also probably no because, you know, he's he's good at range. But he's also relatively hittable. He can be kind of weird, kind of slow, kind of low output, like we saw in the Kyle Nelson fight. But I think Kyle is a much better fighter than Pajuelo all around. I, I really do. He's much more well-rounded, way less hittable than Pajuelo. And th that's, you know, it's not the best loss in 2023, but it's also not a terrible loss to have. I think that Pajuelo, if he's going to win this fight, he either needs a knockout or he needs to just somehow be able to just be backing up Padilla the entire time, keep him against the fence, let it rip to the body, to the head, mix it up. Then I can maybe see him having success here. But I, I think Padilla is just more well-rounded. I think the size is relevant here. He's less hittable. He's a good striker, and he's able to take advantage of that from Pujuelo. And if it gets to the ground at some point, I, I think he's got a significant edge there too because Pavel is horrible on the ground, like absolutely horrible on the ground. So, yeah, the pick will be Padilla. Catching up with the chat real quick. What do we got here? It's Mushroom's birthday. I didn't know that. Happy birthday, Mushroom. And CT agreeing with me on Ogden. I'm glad to hear. And we can move on. So, yeah, P Padilla is the pick. And next fight up, we've got Billy Quarantillo versus Yusuf Zalal. Billy is 18, 5, and oh, he's 35 years old, 5 foot 10 with a 70 inch reach. 
On the other side, Zalal, 13, 5, and 1. He's going to be 27 years old. So he's eight years younger, same height, and he's going to have a five inch reach advantage. Now, Zalal did get cut from the UFC after the draw with Damon Blackshear. And after that, he picked up some wins, but I'm not going to lie. These aren't impressive wins. And I mean, his last win is over a guy who was making his MMA debut for the love of God. So that's <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to me at all. In terms of this matchup, though, I think Billy should win this. I think he's the rightful favorite. Yusuf is also coming in on short notice here. And Billy, we know we know his game, right? He's not the best striker in the world. He's not the best wrestler in the world. He doesn't have the best jujitsu. But he's able to break guys with his pace, with his cardio. He's nonstop. He keeps coming forward. If you want him to stop coming forward, you got to knock him out or take him down. Zalal's got decent wrestling, but do I think it's good enough to take down Billy at a high clip and just keep him down? Not really. I, I don't. And in terms of output, I mean, Zalal's got pretty whack output. He does not throw much on the feet. If he did, I'd be interested in him here, but he doesn't. So I think Billy's going to be winning the minutes. But the problem with betting Billy at chalk is that he doesn't really differentiate himself too much. Unless the guys are breaking, which I don't necessarily think Zalal is the type to break. I don't necessarily think his cardio is that terrible where Billy will just be able to break him like he did Anthony Hernandez, for example. I don't think that's going to be open for him, really. So does he really differentiate himself that much where he's going to be a clear, clear favorite throughout the fight? I don't I don't really think so. The first round against Damon Jackson, he got taken down. It wasn't a great look at all. He even got outstruck on the feet, too. So I think Billy should win, but I'm not comfortable laying chalk on him. If the money keeps coming in on Zalal and I can get something like minus 125, hell yeah, I'd be interested. Short notice for Zalal. I like the pace of Billy much more. I think Billy could possibly get his own takedowns. But I also think that Billy does some things that aren't great. You know, he dips his head down when he's striking. He wings a lot of his strikes. He's not the cleanest. You don't really see a lot of one-twos down the pipe from him. Is, is the law going to knock him out? Probably not. But he can land a decent amount of strikes. I think he can cause some damage if Billy keeps ducking his head like that. So, yeah, Billy will be the pick but I don't want to back him unless the line improves. Yeah, Fight Realm saying full camp, I'd probably pick Zalal. Yeah, I guess at the line. I just think Billy's a better fighter overall too, but he is getting older. He is. I think he is declining a little bit. I really didn't love the Damon Jackson performance. I don't think that was, you know, peak Billy. I think peak Billy has probably passed at this point. But yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. Jeff over here saying he's a cardio guy. Wouldn't be worried too much on short notice. Is Zalal really a cardio guy, though? I mean, I know he had the cardio edge over Blackshear, but Blackshear was on short notice there. When does he really outpace people like that? I, I don't really know if he ever does. He used to be my Muay Thai teacher. That's cool. That's cool. But, I, you know, don't bet with bias. That's all I'll say. All right. Moving on, we've got Peyton Talbot versus Cameron Simon. Tal this is a sick fight. This is such a good one. I'm pretty surprised that they put two prospects like this together this early in their careers, but it it's an awesome fight. We got Peyton Talbot versus Cameron Simon. Talbot is 7-0 undefeated. He's 25 years old, 5'10 with a 70-inch reach. On the other side, you got Simon. He's 9-1-0. He's going to be 23, so he's two years younger, two inches shorter, and he's going to be at a three-inch reach disadvantage. This is a tough one for me to make a pick, at least. I think I'm picking Talbot because Talbot seems to be something special. His striking is awesome. His output is awesome. He's relentless. He's clean, nice, straight, down the pipe. He mixes it up. He goes to the body. He's a great fighter. His takedown defense still needs work. He is getting taken down. You know, Rivas was able to take him down on the regionals. Um, what's his face? Cortez was able to take him down a few times. He got taken down a bunch by Nick Agu Aguirre, I believe is how you pronounce it. And all three of those guys, they have good wrestling credentials, right? But none of them really have the striking to set it up. Out of all of them, Rivas probably has the best striking of the three of the people I just named. But even he's not the best striker. And I think the difference here with Simon is while Simon's not the best offensive wrestler, he's a great striker, very dynamic, very good at creating angles. And he can make Talbot actually have to worry about his hands to the point where he can mix in the takedowns. Nick Aguirre couldn't do that because he can't strike to save his life. Cortez couldn't do that because he's not a great striker. So 
I don't think you should be looking at those fights being like, oh, he stuffed the takedowns versus great wrestlers. Simon can't get him down. I would I wouldn't go that far. I think Simon can get him down. Do I think Simon can out grapple him for 15 minutes? No, not really. So that's why I'm still leaning Talbot. But I wouldn't come into this fight laying chalk on Talbot thinking there's no way this goes to the ground. I, I wouldn't go that far. And I don't want to lay chalk on Talbot, period, because Simon is, is a good striker. He is by far the best guy that Talbot has fought to date. He's really, like I mentioned earlier, I really like the way he creates angles. The kicks are really nice. The hands are good. He's got very solid power. That knockout of uh, Kim on the Contender Series was nasty. Do I think he knocks out Talbot? No, I don't. But I do think he can hurt Talbot, land some significant strikes. But yeah, ultimately, I, I do lean Talbot in this spot. I think the output, the just the technique, just the skills of the guy on the feet, I think ultimately that gets the job done for him. I think he wins the decision. I am curious real quick. I want to see what um, what are the totals on this fight. Probably not good, but let me see. Yeah, over two and a half is minus 185. Fight goes is minus 165. I, I don't want to lay chalk on a, on a total there, but I, I do think both both of them are durable. I, I don't think either gets a finish because how? Is, is Simon going to knock out Talbot? I don't think so. Is he going to submit Talbot? I also don't think so. Is Talbot going to knock out Simon? I really don't think so. So, yeah, I, I tend to think the fight goes – and I'm going to pick Talbot to win, but I'm, I'm not betting him at minus 147 against the best competition he's fought so far. I just, I don't think that's good practice. Moving on, we've got Edmund Shabazian versus AJ Dobson. Shabazian, 12, 4, and 0. Oh, he is 26 years old. Six foot two with a 75 inch reach. It's crazy this kid's still this young. Kid, he's literally my age. It's crazy he's this young still considering how many fights he's had in the UFC already. And then Dobson on the other side, he's 7-2-0, and 0, 32 years old. So he is going to be six years older. Going to be one inch shorter, but he's going to have a one-inch reach advantage. I, I favor Shabazian heavily in this fight. I mean, we, we know what Edmund struggles with. He struggles with good wrestlers. You know, Derek Brunson, Jack Hermanson, even, uh, not even, Anthony Hernandez, who's relentless and has the pace and cardio to just break guys with his wrestling. And even against all those dudes, you know, against uh, Hernandez, I think he defended nine of 16 takedowns, something like that. Or it was nine, something like that. He defended a lot of takedowns. It was just the pace would eventually broke him with Hernandez. Against Hermanson, he defended half of them. Against Brunson, he defended half of them. And all these people are, are much better wrestlers than Dobson. I, I don't think Dobson is that good of a wrestler. He has gotten takedowns before. I mean, he took down... Petrosian three times, but Petrosian has abysmal, abysmal takedown defense. And I think Edmund's takedown defense has come a long way. I think it's improved a lot. I mean, the guy knows, right? He he knows what's been his issue. He is coming out of a good camp, Extreme Couture. They're, they know what to work on. And Dobson, he's just, I never really thought he was that good, to be completely honest. He is also only 7 2 and 0. He doesn't have a lot of fights. He's still super green. I think he's what? Four fights removed, yeah, from his Dana White's Contender Series, three fights removed. And th this guy, Hashem Arhaga, was landing on him, and he, this Arhaga's horrible. Then he lost to Malkoon, which is fine. Malkoon is tough. Uh, Petrosian loss is also fine. That's a decent striker, but if Petrosian can do it, I don't see why Edmund can't. And then Tafan Nechukwi, that's a solid win. But again, I think Edmund is a much better striker than Tafan. I don't think Edmund's going to shoot even though we've seen him wrestle randomly before. I don't think he's going to shoot. I think he's a much cleaner striker on the feet. I think his hands are much faster. I think Dobson is super hittable, and he's very, very slow. So I'm going to pick Edmund here. I'm relatively confident in him getting the job done. And, yeah, I think he's the rightful favorite for sure. Whether he knocks out Dobson or if he wins a decision, that I don't know. But I, I do think he's going to win this fight at a really high clip. Because what's Dobson going to do? Is he going to now grapple him for three rounds? I really don't think so. Is he going to knock out Edmund? I, I really don't think so. So, yeah, I think Edmund's going to win this one. Let's see what we got. Jeff parlayed the over for the Zalal fight with the under in the Arosa fight. Stay, stayed off a side. I don't love the under for the Arosa fight necessarily. I mean, I can see it hitting for sure, but it's relatively one-sided. Like, if a finish comes, it's probably on the side of uh, Ramos. So I don't know if I would personally play that. But then the over for the Zalal fight makes a lot of sense. Is Zalal going to knock out Billy 
I, I don't think so. Is Billy going to finish Zalal late? Z Zalal doesn't really break the way that someone like Anthony Hernandez does. So I, I don't think so. So, yeah, I, I do like that over as a possible parlay piece. Would I do it personally? I, I thought about it. I thought about it, but it's a bit too chalky for my liking. It's like minus 265, which is very, a lot. That's a lot. <clears throat> and Toby over here saying Edmund round three knockout. That could be a look. You know, that that's actually interesting. I'm going to I'm going to look at that. that. That's not a bad look because we have seen AJ slow down a bit. Did I wish my boy Mushroom a happy birthday? Yeah, I did. I did. I did. When someone else mentioned it. Happy birthday, Mushroom, once again. But all right, guys, let's move on. Next up, we've got Carl Williams versus Justin Taffa coming in for his brother who came in for him in when he was supposed to fight uh, Marcos Ruggiero de Lima. So Williams, 9-1-0. He's 34 years old. He's six foot three with a 79-inch reach. Tafa, 7-3-0. He's 30. He's four years younger. He's three inches shorter, and he's going to be at a five-inch reach disadvantage. I like this spot a lot for Williams. I, th I think he should win this fight at a really high clip unless he gets knocked out by Tafa, which is, you know, it's always a possibility at, in MMA and especially at heavyweight and especially against a guy like Tafa who does hit really hard. But if Tafa's not getting an early finish, he's usually not winning those fights. You don't really see him winning decisions often. He lost decisions against Carlos Felipe. He lost the decision to Jared Vandera. He's not a good minute winner. He doesn't have good output. He doesn't have good wrestling that he can rely on to win minutes. Excuse me. So if he he's essentially knockout or bust, and particularly in this fight, I think he's knockout or bust. I don't think he can win the minutes against Williams. I really don't. Williams, you know, his last performance against Chase Sherman, was that impressive? Not really. But, you know, Sherman is a big dude, and he's shown good takedown defense be prior to that fight, and he was able to stuff a lot of the takedowns. But Williams, in general, is getting those takedowns. He got it eight times against Breschke. He got it, I think, three times against uh, Jimmy Lawson. Yeah. And Lawson is actually a credentialed wrestler, whereas William isn't. So Williams getting those takedowns there was impressive. I like the way he shoots. He's very explosive. And, you know, Tafa's never been taken down in the UFC, but I think there's been two attempts against him. Harry Hunsucker, who's not a wrestler. And I think that Carlos Philippe also shot on him once, and Philippe is a boxer, and that's all he does. So, again, do I think he has good takedown defense? It's hard to know. It's really hard to know. You can't really assume things, but I'm kind of assuming no, especially based off of his brother, who can't defend a takedown to save his life, really. Well, he can, but it, it, not good takedown defense. I struggle to see why I should think otherwise with his brother, Justin, here. So for me, I like Williams a lot. I think he's going to win the minutes. Probably wins the decision, but I can see him getting a finish, maybe a submission, something like that. He's not really a guy who's got amazing jujitsu, but if Toph is as bad as his brother on the ground, you know, I mean, his brother looked like a fish out of water in, in, in that fight against Zalima. And it is worth mentioning, Tafa is coming in on short notice. He did have a fight with Delima lined up, but there was some kind of injury. I didn't really know what it was, but I saw like an injury report today that it was like his knee and that his knee really got fucked up. And that's why he couldn't do it, go do that fight. And it hasn't been that long. It's been a couple of weeks. So is that knee really going to be recovered? I mean, I couldn't possibly bet on Tafa here knowing that his knee's probably compromised. He's not a good minute winner at all. And he's really untested in the grappling. And he's fighting a guy who is going to be able to wrestle for 15 minutes. He's fighting a guy who's a decent striker. Should Carl keep this on the feet? No, that's a terrible idea because Tafa is always live for that knockout. But if he can survive past the first round, I think a lot of that knockout threat from Tafa seems to diminish based off his previous performances. So, yeah, I like Carl Williams to win this fight and we can move on. All right, we're up to the main event of the evening. We've got Amanda Rebos versus Rose Nama Yunez. Rebos is 12, 4, and 0. She's 30 years old, 5 foot 3 with a 66 inch reach. Rose on the other side, she's 11, 6, and 0. She's 31, so she's one year older, two inches taller, but she's going to be at the one inch reach disadvantage here. So this is Rose's second fight at Strawweight. She did it, she did it against uh, Manon Fierro in her last time out. And honestly, I. I, I thought she looked pretty good in that fight. I understand she lost, but first off, she had like some kind of weird injury. I think it was on her right hand. I don't remember exactly. So she ended up switching to Southpaw like early in the first round. 
And she still looked pretty good. You know, she won the third round, in my opinion, and on two judges scorecards. And I don't necessarily think she's super declined. You know, I understand that the Esparza fight was really, really strange and just a terrible, terrible performance from both women, but Rose especially. And then, but against Manon, I didn't think that was a bad performance. You know, she came up a weight class against a woman who's pretty big for the division and is a really, really solid range striker. And she was able to hold her own. She never looked completely outclassed there. And again, I think she had an injury on one of her hands. It was her right hand, I believe. And that's going to limit you against a striker. So I don't, I'm not ready to throw Rose out the window and be like, she sucks now. She's on a decline. She's never winning a fight again. I, I don't think that's the case. I do have concerns, and that's probably the reason I'm not going to get to her money line at minus 230, because where is she at mentally? I don't know. You know, two wins in a row will affect somebody. I mean, two losses in a row will affect anybody, especially someone who's used to being at the top of her division, who was champion twice. You know, that, that will get to someone. And also Pat Barry. I mean, the dude is toxic as hell, and he's like her head coach now. I'm pretty sure he still is. First of all, he doesn't know what he's doing. Like in the Esparza fight, he was telling her she's winning and that the crowd booing her is a good thing. I, I don't know what that was. And the guy's just not good for her. I, I don't understand what she's doing there, why he's still her head coach. He's also her husband. So like, I don't think that's a good move. Who really is that successful with their husband or wife in their corner? You should usually have a separate coach. So those are those are concerns I do have with Rose. But honestly, I don't think Reboss is going to win. Personally, I don't think Reboss is going to win. I think Rose is better everywhere. I think she's a better striker. I don't like how hittable Reboss is. I mean, her chin is up in the air. Do I think Rose knocks her out? Not necessarily, but it's a possibility because Reboss is just terrible with that. Just tall woman's defense, chin up in the air like this. It, it, it's not a good look. And Rose is a solid striker. She's got decent power, at least for 155. I don't know if it translates to 125, though. But she's very clean. She takes advantage against Wei Li that in their first fight. That knockout was super, super nice. Really nice uh, head kick that came out of nowhere. So I wouldn't be shocked if she caught Reboss. But even if she doesn't knock her out, I just like her striking better. Reboss, there's not a ton of process there. It's all one-twos, which I like. But I, I, I think she's pretty limited on the feet. I just think Rose is better. I think Rose creates angles really well. And I just think she's going to outstrike Amanda. So then we turn to the grappling. Is there a huge edge for either woman on the grapp in the grappling? I don't really think so. Amanda does have good takedown defense, so I could see her stuffing the takedowns of Rose. But we have seen her taken down, and I wouldn't be too shocked. And Can Rebus take down Rose? Probably. Probably, but I think Rose's takedown defense has improved a lot as well. And I, I think she's a pretty good defensive wrestler. So I don't really think Reboss is going to be taking her down and controlling her for rounds and rounds at a time. Fight Realm, I'm pretty sure that Whitman was in her corner up until the Esparza fight. I could be wrong there, but I'm pretty sure he was. So like I'm I'm almost certain he was in the second Wei Lee fight because that's the that's the card where he had to coach three of them from his camp, right? He had Usman, he had Gaethje, and I'm pretty sure he had Rose there too. So I think the first fight where she was with um, with just her husband, Pat Barry, I think that was in an Esparza fight moving forward. So, yeah, uh, I do agree with you. I'm questioning which version we we're going to get. Yeah, I mean, we're, we all are, and that's why I can't really get behind Rose at minus 235, but I don't really have interest in Reboss either because unless Rose comes out there, looking like she did against Esparza and just not doing anything. I don't think she loses personally. Cal Dixon over here. Couch won't admit it. Oh my God, bro. Stop it with that. Uh, fight realm. Oh yeah. Whitman. You're right. Yeah. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure she was with Whitman up until Esparza. So yeah, I, I like Rose in this fight. I'd need a better line to back her. I, you know, if you're going to force me with parlay pieces, I don't really like many on this card. So I guess I would, maybe do rose but i'm i'm not gonna do it I don't, I don't think it's a good move considering we just don't know where she's at this is a relatively new uh division for her and rebus isn't terrible you know she's a good fighter and it wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world if she was able to upset rose but what i do like here we go Khadim reading my mind how long do you think the fight goes 
I think the fight goes 25 minutes. I I, I do think we're going to go the distance. I think we're going to go all five rounds, and it is plus money. So it's a spot I have some interest in. If a finish does come, I think it's probably Rose because I just I don't see how Rebus finishes her. Like, is she going to knock her out? How? Because she knocked out Luana Pinheiro, who gasses horribly. I don't think so. And I mean, like both both of these fights, right, right here, Luana and Viviane, both gassers, both gassers, where she was able to take advantage. Macy Barber, she had terrible defense there, got knocked out. In the Caitlin fight, that was that was a close fight, but I think Rose is a better fighter than Caitlin, and I don't think many people would disagree there. So yeah, I'm not going to beat a dead horse. I, I like Rose to win this fight. I, I really do. But in in terms of what I rather bet, I'd be more interested in fight goes because, like I said, if a finish does come, it's probably on the Rose side. But I don't think she necessarily finishes Rebus. She could knock her out. I don't think she can submit her. So I, I think the fight goes of plus money is probably your best bet. Rebus can accumulate damage to a doctor stoppage. Do you mean like Rebus can get damaged or Rose getting damaged? Because I, I don't see Rebus attritionally finishing Rose. I, I, I don't. Can Rose do that to Rebus? Maybe. Maybe. But I don't think so either. I, I think goes to the decision is a decent spot. But yeah, guys, that's it. That's a card. That's 14 fights. I honestly like this card a lot. I think a ton of underdogs are barking. You really can't go wrong with a lot of the dogs here. I would be careful with the favorites. There's not really many people who I think are great parlay pieces. And it's just a, a card where you got to be careful, but it should be a lot of fun. I think a lot of these fights are going to be super violent. I think a lot of these fights are going to go, are not going to go to decision. So we should have a good card ahead of us. In terms of what I got going on, this is going to be it for this week. No interviews, nothing like that. Next week, I got something big coming up that I got to take care of. So next week, I'll be solo for my show as well. But after that, we'll go back to having guests and all that fun stuff. Um, and I am going to be doing my YouTube shorts. I'm going to do those tomorrow. If you prefer one-minute videos over a long-form video like this, that's what my shorts are. I post one for every single fight on the card. It's only one minute long. I talk pretty fast, so I think I get a decent a bit of information in. And you can check those out. They'll probably be out tomorrow. I can't tell you exactly what time of day, probably later on in the day. And then that's going to that's gonna be it. We do have Bellator this week. I'm not going to have the time to do a video. I might have a few plays. I had some interest in Aaron Jeffrey, but the line is kind of gone at this point. I would have needed solid plus money to, to get there. And yeah, that's it, guys. Oh, may, I did do an interview, though, last week with uh, Jared Gooden. Awesome interview. Awesome guy. I had a great time. It was by far my favorite interview I've done. The dude is awesome. Really good. Uh, what's it called when they have a good mind? Really good uh, mindset. <laughs> really good mindset set for good. In. And I'm looking forward to him fighting again. So if you guys are interested, check out that interview. It is on my channel. And again, remember... All my official bets are now on the Beer Money Discord. You can find the link in the description of this video. You can find it on my YouTube bio, and you can find the link in my Twitter bio as well under my link tree. It's a great group of guys over there and women, actually. We've got a woman capper, too, who's really good at what she does. And I don't know a lot of sports. I only know MMA. I don't know anything about anything that involves a ball or anything that involves darts or horses or anything like that. But we've got guys and women for everything. They, they're they really good at what they do. They're hitting really big bets every single night. And there's a lot of people cashing out. And you can find my MMA bets there as well. That's where my full slates go. So make sure to check that out. And you could get a 25% discount with Couch Warrior Pod. That is the code. So make sure to use that if you are going to sign up. And yeah, that's it, guys. Remember, my free pick of the week is Cody Gibson. Love that spot. And that's all I got. So peace out, guys. Thank you for tuning in and good luck this weekend.